It is such an honor today. I am so uh, excited and honored um, to have Laura Langmeyer as our uh, guest today. And I'm going to start out by reading her bio, but um, we met recently um, at an event, a virtual event that we were doing, and, and Sharon Lecter was also participating. And Sharon has just been uh, just, oh my gosh, someone that I have admired forever. She wrote the intro to our book. And um, I learned on that at that event that uh, Laura was actually involved in the Rich Dad Poor Dad um, series. And so I want to hear more about that after I read your um, bio. Yes. So Laura Langemeyer is living proof that it makes no difference where you start in life. Anyone can have a life of his or her dreams. Laurel is a money expert thought after speaker, best-selling author, and owner CEO of Integrated Wealth Systems, a wealth coaching company. Growing up on her family's farm in Nebraska, Laurel learned the value of hard work, persistence, and how to get things done, even in the face of much opposition and criticism. Laurel began her career working for the Chevron Corporation right out of college. It was clear to her early on that there was more to life than cubicles and trading time for dollars. Despite her own fears and persuasion from friends and family against it, Laurel quit her job at Chevron to become an executive coach. Virtually overnight, Laurel quadrupled her income as an executive coach while working much less. With her newfound freedom of time and accumulation of wealth, she founded Live Out Loud Inc. As a single mother, Laurel has since dedicated her life to helping men and women from all walks of life to become millionaires and have time to spend with their families. Laurel's passion is to help families enjoy wealth and prosperity is what has motivated her to write five best-selling books. And today, under Laurel's direction, Integrated Wealth Systems is a multi-international organization as a single mother of two children, she is defining the possibility for women to have it all and raise their children in an entrepreneurial and financially financially literate environment. So Laurel, um, I want to hear more about the Rich yeah. Dad Poor Dad. I did not, I never knew about that connection before that day. Yeah. So like you said, I was at Chevron. Um, I have a finance degree and an exercise physiology master's degree. So I kind of did what everybody does that doesn't want to go get a job is I went, kept going to school. So what I was doing for Chevron was as an exercise physiologist and an analyst, I was uh, analyzing how unhealthy people were costing Chevron a ton of money. And I built 272 fitness centers on offshore oil rigs. So I was just kind of over all of that life. I was living in San Francisco at corporate headquarters by then. And um, I was actually up at a huge uh, women's executive ranch with Bob Proctor and speaking up there. And he said, you know, you got to meet Sharon and, and Robert. And I'm like, who are they? And this is 1996. And he said, well, you want to leave this corporate job and you want to go do something else. He said, you know, just see. Anyway, so when we met, I flew down to Phoenix, met them, Scottsdale, at Sharon's kitchen table, right? Met Sharon and Robert. And they're like, and what do you do? You build fitness centers? Like, and what, what are you going to do with us? And I saw the game and I said, well, who's going to work on the game? Because you guys are working on the book. And so I became the master distributor of their cash flow game wow. and uh, put it on the map. So I immediately quit Chevron. I kept doing some executive coaching back uh, because I quit so quickly just as a great turnover process and then went and got really busy figuring out how the hell honestly to sell a game right wow. I mean and you have to remember when I quit I mean all, for all my friends because I had a huge executive job so Laura you'd love this right is they would say so why are you going to follow this Japanese guy in a game round like what are you doing because he wasn't right nobody knew this brand and here I left this huge six-figure job to go put a game on the map and you know if, if if it wouldn't have happened like a lot of things you know launches don't happen that well it would at least it transitioned me and I think that's the big message for a lot of people on the the podcast and listening just movement creates more opportunities and a lot of people just say right where they are and then you know something else happens something else happens and all of a sudden you're you know at the next place in your life so yeah I've had a good five-year run with them and then I started uh, Live Out Loud in 2000 2001 and I've uh, been on a big trajectory ever since. Cool well I love that game as well my daughter has it my grandkids play it and oh my gosh it is such a great game especially for young people to teach them the things that we should be teaching in school. 
Yep. Yeah. Well, and so look at the game, like, so notice up there, I have what's now the Millionaire Maker game. So once I launch my best selling, I mean, I just know, you know, I say Monopoly is the beginner, then cash flow, because it's just about cash flow. And then if you want all of the components, then you have a Millionaire Maker. So that's the next one, Janine, your, your kids and family. Yeah. 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 Much more okay. advanced, um, but still eight, nine, 10 year olds, you know, pretty switched on kids. They can play it. Cool. So our goal with this podcast is really to just um, elevate the awareness of this profession. And so many people are operating with inaccurate beliefs about network marketing. And I just thought as someone uh, that is so passionate about helping women and families create real time freedom, the ability to have both time and money, I thought it would be so good to hear from you about what your thoughts are about how network marketing fits into that equation yep well and i've taken my company all over the world um 2015 16 i met my canadian husband so then slowed it down but between probably 2008 9 once the uh, you know america did a great job with the financial crash i took off with my kids and went around the world so i've taught in every continent exactly you know financial literacy and money and you know what's so interesting is Americans have, Canada, Canada a little bit, but Americans have such a weird stigma about direct sales and MLMs and you know what it means. And it's only for like the stay at home moms and some little you know people who can't figure out how to be an entrepreneur. And there's nothing more than the truth. I remember walking streets from Kuala Lumpur to Singapore, um, even downtown uh, in, in Australia, where bri like brick and mortar, how serious they take these businesses. You literally, you walk by a Jamba Juice, you have, it's called the franchise model. You have a Jamba Juice, you have a, you know, Starbucks, you got a McDonald's and you've got an X, you know, whatever that company is. And direct sales that has in international spaces. And I think everybody knows that China is huge, uh, especially Southeast Asia, but it is just as big in Africa. It is just as big in the Middle East. Um, because it's an easy startup, right? Now, I still think that there's a lot of work to do. And that's probably, you know, the work I love to do is help them get to money, get to cash and make money faster. Uh, but as far as a business, regardless of the product line or the service line, it's one of the fastest and I'd say performance rewarding uh, opportunities people can do. So, so Laurel, it, it, I love what you teach and educate and there's such a need for that uh, too. And so many times what we think about money comes from how we were raised and we don't even understand our subconscious feelings about money and how they sabotage us. So do you, yeah. you talk about with your clients and students that network marketing is a viable option and what okay. kind of misconceptions do you encounter? What, what, what do, what do some, how, what do they sometimes think and you're able to help change their thinking about? So uh, I not only uh, promote them, I used to, uh, I, I've owned, I've been an owner in four of them, uh, which I'm not anymore. i am sold out two positions. The other two are interesting stories, um, but I'm actively, very actively in three right now. I've, I don't even know a year that I haven't been active in one um, and how I do it's a little different because of, you know, what I do. I mean, I'm the money expert, but then I align around that. I think the, the misconceptions are, uh, well, I'm just going to go from the positive. Like, I love marketing and selling, and if you really don't like marketing and selling and promoting, I think it is a, it's a it's not an un, it's not an impossible business, but it, I don't think that people are told that enough. So I think that's why it's a disconnect. You have to be a promoter or connected to a promoter, or at least have now some technical ability to get it online. So I think that's a huge one. But the bigger one is the misconception about inventories. Um, that you have to carry an inventory. That's what I love about it. You can do it from anywhere in the world. You don't have to carry any inventory. I think there's still a few companies, like one of the businesses, I mean, um, we're not talking about the company, but one of the items is a wine that I'm in. And we do do online wine tastings. Um, one of my top level you know, students and clients in that, she does a wine and dine where she, she pairs and does this cool thing right here, like on a Zoom. Um, and she's done it every Wednesday night. She does a wine and dine. And you know, teaches you how to wine taste. And um, the, I have another client uh, that's been a while, but she's uh, paired it and done like a chocolate tasting and a wine tasting. So there's in those cases, if you want to do it, a little bit of inventory, but you actually don't have to do it. So I think inventory is a big mistake. Um, I think the personality to carry forward success because you are going to have to promote. You're going to have to lead. You're going to have to, you know, enroll people. And I don't think some people realize that that's as you know aggressive. I'm going to say unnecessary. Um, 
what are the other ones? Uh, probably don't understand the use of teams. And I don't know if that's a, a misgiving, but a mistake they're making is they don't know how to build a team around themselves. So then they make it harder. Those are probably the biggest ones I see. Yes, very good. Yes, those are. Those are. And we address some of those with our podcast. So if you are listening and haven't heard some of those, be sure to check out some episodes where we address the kind of things that she mentioned. Um, so how do you feel? Tell me more about network marketing as an option for professionals in the corporate world. What are some of the advantages and reasons why someone that's in a corp in the corporate world, like you were, like I was, that I think sometimes we're prejudged. People assume, well, you're not going to be interested in this. Um, but what what are some of the advantages and reasons why someone in corporate would be? Yep. And I'm going to say corporate and I'm going to add another one, gurus, you know, influencers, like why am I in one? I mean, like I was just telling you ladies before we got on, I'm approached if not every day, uh, every week for sure. Yesterday I was approached by two to be a top influencer and leader. So you take your corporate status and you lead over there. And I can tell you a lot of the corporate training. I mean, it's one of the things probably I do appreciate about Chevron is the amount of training they put you through mandatorily that you don't realize then when you're going through team building and leadership and vision work and blah, 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 blah work, right? All of that, you know, mandatory training you go through, it, it serves a great pur purpose out here as an entrepreneur. So, um, and I think a lot of corporate people also want to transition. I mean, we are, you know, COVID is only supposed to last a few months and here we are and it's created a new choice, right? It's created a huge new choice for how people want to work. And, you know, I got to the playing field right away. I was probably one of the first um, summits and trainings to have people that were laid off say, if you don't want to go back, don't go back and here's some choices. And I'm very uh, prominent in our training about teaching you to make money. And people say, what if I don't know what to do? Guess what the first three things are the three that I'm in. I'll say, well, here's three different choices and three different things you could do. And if you don't like my three, go find, there's a hundred of them, thousands of them. So they're the first thing I put up, regardless of somebody being uh, just not a great entrepreneur. They, they need to, to hinge to something because they got to sell something. When people aren't making money, it's because you don't know how to sell anything. And you got to sell something. So it doesn't have to be like your favorite thing to sell forever. But for now, it's transitional cash. It's the other way that I, I teach it. I said, it doesn't have to be like forever and ever, but at least you're making some money. You're getting money back on the products that you're consuming. So why not do it? It would be interesting to have you, this is not really a how-to kind of podcast, it's really, but I, it would be so interesting to have you talk to this sometime to, to do a show about that, because I would be so interested to hear about your thoughts about building a team. And, you know, I, I think helping people make money quickly is an important thing to be able to do. Yeah. So why do you think more professionals are not um, pursuing network marketing? Uh, again, I speak to the U.S. professionals. Um, again, it's just so distinctive when you are in other countries. The prominence of direct sales businesses are, I mean, you, you literally walk through the streets and they are the brick and mortar. Like, I mean, huge offices. Um, the only city I know in the United States where you can drive through and see almost every corporate office is in Salt Lake City, right? From, you know, you can just drive up 80, you can drive down any of those and you're seeing every one of them in massive corporate offices. So I think there's just this odd stigma that happened, you know, way back. And I'm gonna, I, I, you said, I can't say one company, but I'm gonna say the Amway days. You know, it's just this weird stigma it's just, that it's like below people. And it's like, are you kidding? I, especially people who haven't been, you know, like, you know, I, I got all the degrees and blah, blah, blah. But regardless of that, it's, it's extra income. And I always say for the things that you're using, why not get a check back the next month for the very thing you're using the first month? Uh, so I think there's just a stigma in the United States about it. And it, I think we're more, I think that's going to change. I think COVID's changed a lot. And uh, I think everyone's kind of redesigning their rules and their patterns. But, you know, in America, I think there's such a reward and a, um, what do I say? Um, yeah, I'm going to say reward or professional acknowledgement is probably the word I'm looking for of having a lot of degrees. Like, why did I get a master's degree in exercise physiology? Because I want to stay in school and take tests for two more freaking years? No. Like, I honestly went on and got part of a PhD and then thought, what the hell am I doing? Like, that's just a whole bunch more letters. That's not a bigger bank account. Like, I had to go back to the bank account for me, like, because that's really what I want. I don't need like all these letters. And I think there's an acknowledgement of being accomplished. With, by having all these letters versus the bank account with lots of numbers. And I can just tell you, you will get faster numbers in a direct sales model if you're willing to work. And the other thing, you know, that I don't think a lot of people talk about 
um, is athletes. Um, athletes are by nature competitive, right? There's a first and your second is the first biggest loser. Um, and we're trained like that. I was trained as an athlete. I think more athletes, um, if introduced to the opportunity, maybe in a way that they can consume the idea of it, would be some of the most extraordinary uh, leaders. Like they are, and a lot of I, I can name a lot of them. So you have to kind of understand, you know, your reward uh, behavior. That's probably some of it. Um, I could go, I could go one place, but then I'll end up political, and we probably shouldn't go there today. <laughs> Let's talk about the timing of right now, because you mentioned COVID and we're in this. We are. <laughs> yeah. and, um, let's, let's talk about why is now the best, why, why is it one of the best times to consider network marketing as an option for generating additional cash? Um, and you might even speak to, because I know you do teach this, the, some of the tax benefits related yeah. to having your own business. Yeah, and so it's kind of two different things. Why the time now is because you are at home and you do need to do extra income. And unlike, like, I mean, I'm a pretty off stage, you know, or on, you know, I traveled. I mean, when I when COVID hit March seventh, I was flying home from Houston from a big event. And uh, upon landing by that next week, by March eleventh, had fifteen stages in the next few months canceled. So having lived that life. Um, it did get more challenging to do it, but when you're home and you don't have the travel distraction and all of that other, um, I don't know an influencer, guru, author, speaker who hasn't picked up at least one, if not two different, you know, lines. I think it's always extra income. I think depending on the product or service, uh, it's easy to put it in your family. Um, the biggest reason why I endorse it, well, lots of reasons, but I see the biggest overarching would be that it is a legal reason to have a business, which means you can be incorporated an LLC, S Corp, probably for uh, direct sales, not really a C Corp, not right the vehicle or a limited partnership, but you can have a company. Now you have a legal reason to make money. Now you can do all the deductions. So now you can write off your you know, computer. You can write off, like in my situation, my wine, my habit, my hobby, um, <laughs> right? Um, you can, like, there is so much that you can do. Uh, legally to then reduce your taxes. The other thing too, Laura, I want to add and really, uh, and I know some people probably don't understand it, but high income earners are the, the corporate employees. I mean, those are the, high, when they say they're going to tax the rich, they're not talking about me. I don't make hardly any money as an employee. Like, right, my companies make money. I don't make money. So there's a big difference. And for a corporate executive or a sports athlete, I'm going to say, or, you know, that a, a high income earner, that's a W-2, that's a paycheck. To have a business against it, meaning against it because you have the depreciation schedule, the deduction schedule, you actually lessen your tax burden. So, I mean, we've taken people, um, in fact, there's a, there's a couple that they are uh, Air Force fighter pilots. They make north of 400,000 and um, they actually have a formal wine touring business where they take people well, to what used to be Napa and Sonoma, now the fire's God knows what's going to be left over there, but they legally would take them over there. And then they actually do direct, you know, retail wine, but they also do this direct sales wine because it's an extra write-off. So when they can take and have a huge high income and have huge deductions, legal business, you don't go on vacation now, you go on business trips. So when we teach you how to really use this as a, a vehicle for wealth, you will totally change your mind and very quickly about it. Yeah, I think that it's an important it's an important concept about not how much money you make, but how much money you keep. And we're not taught that in school. I don't love that you're teaching that and leading people through that to be just money wise and money smart. So back to the business of network marketing, we've all known and we've seen and we've heard people talk about the failure rate or the dropout rate. Um, you've, you've been around this for a while. What, what, what do you say about that? Why, why do you think that that happens and, and what do you, how does that strike you? So I think the failure rate isn't just in direct sales. I think it's in most small businesses. And there's one variable that I've seen over all of it. And you don't know how to make money fast enough. So if you can't make money, you can't pay bills that could be legal deductions and you get frustrated because you're not seeing it and you're used to money coming from a paycheck. So you're used to putting in a moderate, around, a moderate amount of effort as an employee and getting a paycheck. And then, you know, that seems easy. So if you don't make money fast enough, you know, a couple of things happen. You can't hire the team that you want to hire because as an entrepreneur, you're expected to do a lot and we're not trained to be entrepreneurs. So as an entrepreneur, you have to market, you have to sell. You have to do your own accounting. 
you don't actually, you can hire it. But again, if you don't have enough money, you know, I always say, here's my funny thing too, ladies. I always say is if you're not making enough money, the, and any money you do make, put it towards marketing and sales. Do not hire an accountant. There's no money to count. They can worry about that later. It is the least, right? It's like, don't worry about being all organized. Worry about cash flow coming in. So I think the entrepreneur and the other, you got to fulfill. There's just the other thing too, as I say all these things an entrepreneur needs to do, I don't want to overwhelm you, but be realistic. Like you are a company owner. The benefit of direct sales is all you really have to worry about is marketing and sales. You can do a little bit of accounting once a quarter, once a month, if you really want to. And then as far as the fulfillment, it's pretty much all handled on the backside. You don't have to have all the technical setup. And so it does, the startup costs are so much less. But overall, I say you don't get to money fast enough, so you get frustrated. But that also is because you're not entrepreneurial trained. And the three big skill sets I teach entrepreneurs is marketing, sales, and cash flow. I have a son who's getting a triple major in Georgia, very awesome school, and you know, he's now a junior and I'll, it's so funny to have him call home, you know, he's in a management class and that'll be in a marketing class. He's like, mom, they're just teaching me to be an employee. They're teaching me nothing. Like he grew up with me in this conversation, right? Um, you know, they're, you're not taught to be an entrepreneur. You're, we're taught to go be employees. And now you try to take off that corporate hat and you, this isn't an occupation. This is a business. And so there's a lot of interesting just psychology in that transfer, I know when I went from being an exercise physiologist to the cash flow master distributor, you know, I did, I had an identity crisis because people knew me as Laurel at Chevron and, you know, the fitness girl building fitness centers. Now, all of a sudden, one day I'm following a Japanese guy in a game around. They're like, what the hell are you doing? I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So just saying the words, right? I'm a master distributor. Like it was sort of like a foreign language. So I do think that if you are going to straddle, which is being corporate and have a direct sales, I would lean all of your identity to the direct sales because that is going to be your life going forward. These people over here, welcome to COVID, could just fire you. So I just think a lot of people have this identity crisis. They don't understand being an entrepreneur. And if you don't know how to be an entrepreneur, you don't make money. And then the cycle continues. Does that kind of answer it? <laughs> yes, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe you could also address um, just kind of the different generations. Like one of the things I'm hugely passionate about is baby boomers and this being such a good fit for that generation because yeah. what else are they going to do? What other kind of job can you get when you're you know, 65 or 70? Um, but really maybe speak to, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, maybe why it, it would, yeah. is a good fit for those generations. Well, clearly for baby boomers, like you said, I mean, most of them didn't uh, have any good financial organization. So, I mean, you know, I guess, you know, Walmart and, you know, Home Depot are hiring and they can sit in their little orange vest and direct traffic, you know, to an aisle. Um, and I say that kind of sarcastically, but it's because they didn't put enough money away. And there's less than, I think, 29% of baby boomers today that have enough money to live. So they have to make some more money. Otherwise they, they can't live on the planet unless they have amazing children that are gonna take them in. So um, it's a great time. Plus it allows you, as you ladies know, to drive around an RV. You can do it from anywhere. You can do it from anyhow. Is there a little tech skills? Yes, I do think you need some tech skills. Um, the Gen Xers are kind of what I call the workaholics of the you know current world. Um, I'm kind of in that category. Um, so for us, I think it's a lot of additive revenue and easier revenue than some of our used to. Millennials, if they could get like, you know, a work ethic together, and I do say that pretty broadly and strongly, um, I tend to turn them over quickly, but the benefit for them, <laughs> and that was kind of a sharp hit at them, but it's also wake up because this is an industry that would be perfect for them. They don't want to buy. They love to rent. They love simple, simple renting. I mean, I'm hugely in real estate. I'm a real estate millionaire, a multimillionaire. We're doing a massive $10 million complex in, in the Midwest. And we're gearing the majority of one ones. You don't do one ones, one one, meaning single unit, one bedroom, one bath. Like, but that's how millennials like to live. So it's so interesting. It's so easy and flexible for them if you can get them to go do the work. And they're typically very technical. So I think millennials have a huge upsurge. If for those who don't want to go to university, don't want to do college, don't want to do this online learning stuff that a lot of kids are having a hell of a frustrating time doing, I think millennials would, would, would thrive if they would get it, if they would understand it. Cool. It, I would, love their that. Lifestyle. it would totally fit their lifestyle. Yeah. So we'll just close with one more question. Yeah. Um, what, what, do you, what are oh, your wait, thoughts? Wait, 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 wait. One more huge money thing. 
um, almost every company that I'm aware of, you can generationally uh, give as an inheritance. So that is a huge one. So I know you didn't even ask a question, but a lot of people say, well, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna build this and then do what with it? You pass it on. But then that also means you better be training somebody to hold it on and to manage it and maintain it. But there is some lineage to it. And I don't think a lot of people realize that there is a legacy that you can do. And one of my best, best, best friends, um, father started one of the largest that is on the, um, the Dow and on the NASDAQ and uh, is, you know, born multi multi-millionaire into a trust from that. So just going to say there is, there is some big games to be played out there for those who want to put it in the, the family's life. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. We've <laughs> never talked about that. So that's, that's really good. So what are your thoughts about what it takes to be successful in network marketing? What do you think are the most important traits, qualities? What is it? What's the magic? I'm going to say you got to love the product because I do believe that I think because you're going to have to promote the heck out of it. Like I say the same to my affiliates to promote my stuff. If you're not totally in love with what, you know, the work I teach, you're, you're only going to do it halfway. So I do think unlike other things, you do kind of have to know the product and love the product. Um, I think that the once you get past that early stages of making money, I think the freedom of choice and lifestyle is the biggest thing that, you know, I say to hold on to and to go get really, really serious about, because, you know, the learning curve for some seems super simple and for others it's rough. So hold on to the bigger goal, hold on to the bigger vision and you'll get there. Great. And have a damn good team around you, have huge leaders around you, huge leaders. Yes. Yes. And we have to have you back to teach us how to, how to build a team. I would love to I, do I that. That was very interesting. Well, thank you so much. It's been thank such you. an honor to have you here. We're so grateful. So thanks for sharing your wisdom with our audience. Thank yes, thank you. And for everyone that's listening, we will have in the show notes links where you can find more and get connected with Laurel and what she has to offer. We're big fans, Laurel. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Have a great thank day. You.